Hello and welcome to Talking Books. I'm Jill de Villiers. Today we are venturing into the Middle East, specifically into the aftermath of the ground war that ousted Saddam Hussein in March 2003. My guest is Yuan Rat, author of the book Blood Money, stories of an ex recce's missions as a private military contractor in Iraq. This is the first book on the war in Iraq written by a South African. Johan, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Joel. Before we start getting into the nitty-gritty of the book, tell me about your life as a Reiki. You went immediately as a Reiki. You passed in and, and yes. succeeded in to become a Reiki immediately. Yes, it, it's actually not that easy, but I had my mindset from an early age in, uh, when I was a teenager, say from 12, 13, I decided that I want to go to South African Special Forces. And um, we still did the conscription, the two years. So I was called up to the infantry school and um, there the special forces came around and they did like a pre-selection because there's, there's a couple of selections that you have to pass in a year training course. So I passed the first one and I was put on a train to Durban and I was fortunate um, there wasn't many times, I think only two times in the history of special forces where they did basic training in special forces. You normally had to go to a different unit, different arms, like an infantry unit or the parachute battalion, do your basic training and then come and try special forces. Anyway, they, they needed um, special forces guys in the 80s and I was fortunate enough, it was tough though, but I was fortunate enough to have done basic training within special forces. Mm -hmm. After that we did our uh, selection training and the year training which included parachuting, um, working with small boats in, in maritime conditions, demolition, survival, bush warfare, urban warfare, all that. And at the end of that year, I qualified at the end of 1986 as a Special Forces Operator. So I was there until 1992 for seven years, and then I started working internationally as a private security contractor. Now, this is the elite. It's like the SAS of South Africa. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, now we've got uh, close ties and uh, with SAS, um, with all the Delta Force guys, we know a lot of them and later on in years after 94 when the sanctions was lifted, our special forces did a lot of cross training with, with uh, overseas uh, entities like the SAS, like Delta Force, uh, like the French forces. So there was a lot of cooperation after apartheid fell, which is a good thing. Um, yeah, so we're in the same class. We're all kind of elite military forces in the world. So you started your own company then, and then a few years later, I just want to jump over you. You also did uh, Bertrand Aristide, you were one of his uh, security guards. Mm. Just quickly look at that before you went, go, and then to let's Iraq. go into Iraq. I started working internationally in the 90s um, in, in conflict war, war zones, conflict zones, um, mostly as a protective agent for people that needed protection in these environments. Um, and uh, then in 2002, I ended up in Sierra Leone and in Sudan where we uh, worked with American uh, government uh, grant for the Americans protecting um, NGOs and people that did the good in the country and then the year thereafter, after 2003 I worked for the president of Haiti. Um, in, in Haiti I was senior agent on his bodyguard team for over a year then he was ousted and our team flew him over here to South Africa where he spent time in exile and after that, the company that had the contract with him found a contract in Iraq and they asked us if we wanted to go over and I was keen. Uh, by then, a few South Africans had been there already for a while and um, we all wanted in on the action. So, um, yeah, we knew it was going to be a challenge because a couple of South Africans has passed away already by the mm -hmm. time when I left. In, I, I went there in April 2004. And I think two South Africans or two or three has been killed already mm -hmm. by that time and a few more contractors. So we realized it was dangerous, but uh, it was, you know, if, if it's in your blood, if you're a soldier and if you're a dedicated private military contractor, this kind of thing is a challenge and you need to go and see what it's all about. So I left for Iraq in 2004. Yeah. So you said you wanted to get back into the action, but the action was not to fight. As yes. a private military contractor, the action was to protect. Yeah, that's an important yep. point that I need to also explain to your audience is it is unlawful according to the UN and, and the South African government to go and fight on behalf of another government or another organization that's classed as mercenary activities. But if you go and do a protective task um, like we did in Iraq, uh, installations, convoys, personnel and so on, hospitals, airfields, um, then it is deemed a security job. In our, in our line of work it's called a high-risk security uh, mission. 
and, and you, you are a private military contractor. There's a very thin line between a private military contractor and a mercenary. It just depends what you're going to go and do. Mm -hmm. It's not the person as such. Mm -hmm. I can do both. Mm -hmm. And so can most of the private military contractors. So you have to be careful in what you get involved with. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, Iraq was, was straightforward. Um, the government did try to, um, uh, the South African government did try and have a look at is it lawful, is it illegal, and so on. But no, they couldn't, they saw it was US government funding and all the embassies in the world, the UN recognized the work we did there and everything else. So it was legitimate and to this day there's been no problems. But yeah, you have to be careful. However, if you do protective work in a country like that and you get attacked, you have to fight back. You have to shoot back. So there were incidents where South Africans, private military contractors had to return fire on Al-Qaeda insurgents and other terror groups. And, and yeah, so at times you're going to have to defend your life in a high risk scenario. And if you kill a few baddies, then be it. But that's not your task. That's not mm -hmm. why you go there. Mm -hmm. You go to protect people, installations, mm -hmm. convoys and so on. Mm -hmm. Now looking back at, uh, at the war, do you think that that it was more of a case of uh, appeasing the Americans' conscience than, than making a real difference. Do you think it would have, the place would have been better off if Saddam Hussein had stayed on? That's a long and um, divisive and also complicated subject, however. Remember, after 9-11, America is the number one power in the world. You're a superpower, you get hit like never before with, with, with the 9-11 attack and so many people that died. You can't sit back and just not do anything. So they thought it best to invade Afghanistan and eventually that led to the, the killing of bin Laden. Um, and they also decided to go into Iraq. Now, the decision to go into Iraq can be debated about. Remember, we're soldiers, we're not politicians. Mm -hmm. We just go where we're told to go. But in hindsight, I think they might have done it differently. They were misled by informants out of Iran, which was in opposition to Saddam's rule, that there was weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and, they, and rightfully, they had to try and act on it. And when they got there, there wasn't uh, weapons of mass destruction. But what Saddam had, which a lot of people don't know and which the mainstream media didn't cover, is the fact that he did have a nuclear research program, just south of Baghdad. And in the early 80s, both Saudi and Israel bombed that facility, but he kept working at it. I, we had guys that, that worked there as security guards in the early 2000s. So he was doing nuclear research and don't forget he had lots of chemical weapons because the Iran-Iraq war from 1980 to 88, he killed, they reckon, over 150,000 people with, with chemical warfare. Mm. In 1988, in the northern town of Halabja, there were 7,000 Kurds killed in one day by Saddam, by chemical gas, sarin and mustard gas. So he, he was, you know, if, if he could deploy it, he would. And the other thing that a lot of people don't know is that Musabu al-Zarqawi, which is the great-grandfather of ISIS, a very violent person, which committed a lot of atrocities in Iraq, was in his country. He was Jordanian-born, and he was busy setting up terror cells similar to what Al-Qaeda did with bin Laden, and they were also planning mass attacks on the US. Mm -hmm. So maybe they should have just changed the reason to say, look, there are chemical weapons that mm -hmm. we used, we know. Um, they, they are harboring a terrorist that uh, wants to commit atrocities against the USA. Maybe that would have gone down better, but anyhow, a lot of Iraqis will say they are very happy the Americans came and they overthrew Saddam and they are free and they are liberated and so on. But now, since America withdrew in 2011, December 2011, um, the country's fallen a bit back into chaos. And it was quite stable in 2019 and 11. I've got mm -hmm. the stats in the book. Uh, there was few killings, few bombings, few terrorist activities. They had it under control. But then Obama, President Obama, came in power in 2008. And one of the things he wanted to do is try and end the war and the participation. So he withdrew the soldiers in December 2011. And after that, um, ISIS started growing. Mm -hmm. That 2012, 13, and of course, in 2014, they invaded Mosul and Raqqa and they announced themselves to the world as a caliphate. But that happened as soon as the American special forces and guys left Iraq. Mm -hmm which was there. So a vacuum was left. Um, now, after all these years of having terrorism again, a lot of Iraqis will say, you know what, especially the older ones, they, they even in opposition, I mean, they Shias and, and Saddam was a Sunni Muslim, mm. but they will say, look, I think we were better off under Saddam because the roads worked, the hospitals mm. worked, the infrastructure worked, the new government is so corrupt, mm. they can't get anything going. Um, 
they can't get a grip on terrorism. There's a lot of infighting and tribalism. So a lot of them are longing for the old days when things worked, mm. but they hated Saddam. So it's, it's, mm. it's difficult for them. Iraq is in a very difficult position. It's, it's been a punch bag for eons. Mm. I mean, from the Akkadian Empire, which was 5,000 years ago, to the Babylonians, mm. to the Mesopotamians, to um, the Persians and the Arabs, all their empire, empirical fights was in Iraq because you had in the old days Arabia and Persia, which was the two main powers, and then Turkey came in as well, the Turks. So all those countries surround Iraq and they used Iraq as a fighting oh. ground. So Iraq has been uh, engaged with war forever and a day. I sure. just want to come back to you. So you faced lots of dangers there as well, but there were also other discomforts like flies and yes. gnats and unsanitary conditions. Yes. How bad was it? Yeah, it was bad. I mean, the first thing that uh, got to me is when I got out the plane, I think it was the 22nd of April 2004, I flew in from Jordan. And the stench, the stench just hit me. Um, the place that really smelled bad. And that's because of the bombs in 2003, the year before the war. So a lot of sewage pipes was uh, damaged and rainwater canals and things. Nothing was working properly. So there was a big stench. And then, of course, those days there was a lot of uh, bodies as well. You could sometimes on the uh, Tigris River and lower down on the Euphrates when we did patrols or when we went on missions. You would see a body here and a body there. Eventually they will get the body back and bury it as quickly as they can. But sometimes it just didn't happen. So there was flies. I mean, I've never seen flies like that. I've been to Cairo a couple of times and you think yeah. Cairo is number one for flies in the world. But I think back there it's got more flies than Cairo. And then the, the dust, um, we, the, the, within the first week that I was there, we experienced our first dust storm. We've got photos in the book. It is, it looks like something out of a movie, but it ain't. It's real. It's, it's dust that you can't see your hand in front of your eyes. It goes up two, three thousand feet. So bad that the planes can't fly. So often the Baghdad International Airport, also known as Bayer, um, was closed down. Nobody could come in and out because of dust storms. Okay. In 2005, there was a dust storm that killed 103 people and over a thousand were hospitalized with respiratory um, ailments. We're coming to the end of, of our talk, um, but I just want to um, ask you, um, are you going to go back? Do you want to go back to, to war? Do you want to go back to fighting or are you settling down now? My body took a bit of a beating and it's some, I, I spoke about some of it in the book, not all of it, but um, I've, I've been in Iraq 14 years in and out and before that I've been doing this work for a while and also in the military my body, I, I sustained injuries that's chronic to this day that never uh, got fixed up. So um, I'm taking a break. I don't know if I'll go back, you know, never say never. Uh, old soldiers never retire, but for the time being I'm done. I've been uh, in South Africa for almost a year now. I came uh, last, I left Iraq the end of uh, August 2017. And yeah, since, I've, since then I've been busy with the book, the editing and the marketing, and I'm planning to write a bit more in the near future. So I don't think Iraq will see me in a hurry, but I'm also not discounting it because I've made good friends there and I miss the work. And I've left a lot of colleagues there. There's still a lot of my gear and stuff lying there that I must go and retrieve. So maybe I'll go back and maybe do a visit. But for the time being, I must first get medically sorted. Mm -hmm. A few aches and pains need to be taken care of, and then I'll reassess it. Yvonne, thank you so much for coming in and chatting to us. Thank you, Joel. I appreciate the, the opportunity, and thank you very much. And uh, this was the author, Johan Rath, and the book, uh, Blood Money, Stories of an ex Recce's Missions as a Private Military Contractor in Iraq. If you want to know anything about the war in Iraq and how private military contractors work there, this is the book to read. That brings us to the end of this edition of Talking Books. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.